any time we go to your word, we we need to bow and confess our need to be uh, to have the illumination of your spirit. Lord, we cannot come away from your word with a spiritual understanding where we really see Christ unless you help us. And so we pray that our time together here today would be profitable because you are present and because your spirit is leading, guiding, and showing us truth. So we are asking that of you and praying that because we we don't need to just know truth, but we need to know truth in order to live truth. And so, Lord, we do need to live the truth. So help us as we try to know it and put this to work in our lives. So we, again, are just asking that you would, uh, truly your empowering, your blessing, your grace would be upon us at this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, last time we looked at uh, chapter two, uh, Lord, the Lord of the armor. We talked about our need to not so much uh, depend on the armor of God, but on the God of the armor. And as we come into chapter three of my, of my book here, we're going to be back in Ephesians uh, six and actually looking at a couple other, at least one other passage, maybe two other passages, but, but um we're going to look at the chapter called Putting on the Armor, Putting on the Armor. And the reason that uh, I uh, title the chapter this is because that is the next prong of this uh, three-pronged uh, attack in this, uh, the battle plan of winning the war to walk worthy. And if you, if you look at, if you start off looking at Ephesians 6 again together, uh, again, let's note there are these three commands. Do you have these uh, marked in your Bible at this point? These three main commands that form this section on the Christian, on, on the Christian's armor. You've got uh, verse 10, the command to be strong in the Lord. That's what we talked about last week, essentially. And then you've got this command in verse, it's repeated in verse 11 and in verse 13. And so I take these, these three verses as all related to this idea of put, verse 11, put on the whole armor, that's a command. And then verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of, of God. And so you've got these two commands to, that are essentially the same, to put on the whole armor of God. So this is the second uh, prong, so to speak, in, this, uh, in the strategy for winning the war to walk worthy. And then you've got the third command is in verse, verse 14, to stand. And that's the command that then introduces the, the rest of this section. So I want to I wanna focus on that command, putting on the whole armor. And in a sense, what, what we are doing is we're going to answer this question. And I'll just put this question in the chat, but I'll say it as well. Um, what does it mean to put on the whole armor of God? really is the, the question that we want to bring up and and address. And one of the reasons that I, I, I bring this up is because I think sometimes we, uh, we, we, we get a hold of this imagery uh, of putting on the armor and we can almost get a kind of a, a, a kind of a magical or a like a better words, a kind of a Star Trek or Star Wars type mentality. Okay, I've got to put on this, you know, put this thing on every morning when I get up, and this is going to help me uh, light beam or laser beam my 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 enemies and give me success in this in this war to walk worthy. You know, we kind of get this almost this kind of a magical idea. I think sometimes that's what I want to talk about today. Um, let me let me just start. Uh, I'm going to start here by uh, reading the the first very short paragraph in my book, because there is a connection between the first command, "Be strong in the Lord," and then put on the whole armor of God. And I want us to see that see that connection. Here's the way I I begin in this chapter. 
assuming the Lord to be your strength, you need to demonstrate your dependence on him by obeying his command to put on the whole armor of God. That, in some ways, is the point of the command to be strong in the Lord. Depending on his infinite resources gives me the courage to put on the whole armor of God, just as he has commanded. So really the, the first command to be strong in the Lord, to put, to find in him our strength. And we, I, I thought last time, again, we had a great discussion on, okay, how do you do that practically? But finding our strength in him, really the purpose of that is then to go on and obey these other commands that we have in our text. That being strong in him, now let's put on that armor of, of God. So what, what does it mean? Well, it doesn't mean when it talks about putting on the armor of, of God. And let's, let's start by just by focusing on that word armor, not even the whole armor, but just the word uh, armor. Because it's obvious that this is imagery. Armor is imagery. This is a, a metaphor. And we've got to unpack the metaphor in order to get to what, what Paul is asking us to, to do. Because obviously this is not, a literal armor. This is not like what you see if you read the book Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, which is a great book, and he's, he's picturing the Christian life, and at some point a Christian goes into this palace, and uh, he comes out the other side eventually with this actual physical pieces of armor on. And we know that's not exactly, you know, we're not looking at a literal physical armor that we, you know, we go to a church and we, or we leave church and we have this armor on. So what does it mean when Paul talks about putting on the armor? And obviously armor is, is imagery. But imagery for what? I think this is, to me, this is vitally important. And I will emphasize this uh, maybe in another session or, or, or two. I think the best way to answer that, what is this armor, is to, is to look at, a, at some cross-references. And specifically one passage that I want us to emphasize uh, first. And that is in Romans. This is in Romans 13. So I, if, you've got a, if you've got a Bible in some form, either a, a, a literal paper Bible or some kind of an e-Bible, I invite you to look at Romans 13. Because to me, this, this, was, this is really helpful in, in unpacking this. And it's helpful because this is where Paul, uh, he uses the image of armor here also. But he then gives a little bit of a, he, he, he kind of unpacks it for us. Uh, let me start in verse 11. So Romans 13, 11, and that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Okay, so already he's using imagery a little bit. He's got the idea of sleep. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So there's this use of the word armor. Let us put on the armor. And here he refers to it not as the armor of God, but as the armor of light. So how would you put on armor of light? Again, is this some kind of a of a um, laser beam uh, kind of approach. Let us put on the armor of light. But what I think is helpful here in Romans 13 is in verse 13, he, he goes on to talk about it a little bit. I think he really is explaining what he means by putting on the armor of light. So verse 12, let us put on the armor of light. Verse 13, okay, here's what I mean. When I talk about casting off the works of darkness and putting on the armor of light, what I mean is this, verse 13, let us walk honestly or decently as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. In other words, what he says is, okay, when I, when I say to put on the armor of light, I'm not referring to physical pieces. What I'm talking about is the way you live. And he's viewing the kind of a lifestyle you put on He's viewing that under the imagery of armor. So you put on the armor of light by walking honestly in the day and walking in the way that he describes in verse 13. 
That's what it means to put on the armor of light. And I would suggest then that what we're, when we talk about uh, putting on the armor of God, this is what he has in mind. That what Paul's talking about, okay, when I, when I say put on the whole armor of God, what I mean is put on new man behavior. Put on the new lifestyle that we have in Christ. That's what, he, that, that's, that's what he means by putting on the armor of light or putting on the armor of, of God. So we talk about putting on the armor of God. If we go back to our Ephesians 6 passage, what we are talking about is the idea of, okay, let me, I'm going to put on this new man behavior or this new lifestyle behavior that I now have as a Christian. I'm going to put that on. I'm going to wear it is the idea. And um, it, uh, I, I mentioned here in, in the book, walking as a child of light is putting on uh, armor. That's really what, what we're talking about. In Galatians 2.20, I want to come back to, because I think that verse is, is super helpful uh, as well. But let's, let's talk about another aspect. Okay, so putting on the armor of God. So putting on armor is the idea of uh, putting on new man behavior, putting on the new lifestyle that we have in Christ. So what if we focus on the words, putting on the whole armor of God? And I think the idea in this phrase of God, it reminds us possibly of a, of a couple truths related to this putting on the armor or putting on new man behavior or new man lifestyle. I think what it reminds us of partly is that it is, this comes from God. This new man lifestyle is sourced in God. This is what God did for us when we came to Christ and when we were saved. This is what God did for us. This is what God gave us. This is the regeneration. This is the change, the transformation. So that's part of what it means. I think the armor of God, this new man lifestyle that we have gotten from God. But I think you could also argue that this is related to the idea of this is, this is according to God. This is a new man lifestyle that is a result of our being created created anew in a sense um, to live in a new way and this new way is according to God and what this brings up what this what this brings up is this idea of 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 the new man the old man versus the new man and I want us to look at a, a couple passages here um, that, that relate to this idea of the old man and the and the new man um, let's start by going to Colossians chapter 3. And uh, this is where we'll just do a little bit of a, a side study here on this expression uh, related to uh, new man, old man, um, and kind of understanding when we talk about this, what, what we have in mind. So Colossians chapter 3, verse, I'm going to start in verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Now, what is that old man? That old man is the old way of life. And that is what we are to put off. And then if we keep reading, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So when we put on this new man, what is the new man we're referring to? Okay, this is the idea of this. This, this is, comes out of your new nature. You've got a new nature uh, when, you came, when, you, when, you, when you got saved, when you were regenerated, you were given a new nature and you were to put on that new nature or that new man, that new lifestyle is gonna come out of this, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him or according to the image of him that created him. And there's a sense in which when, when, when a person gets saved, that it's almost like they, there is this renewal back in, almost like it's, it's going back into the image uh, because mankind is created in the image of God. Uh, every person is in the image of God. That image of God has been, we use different words in theology, but it's been distorted or damaged or injured, but it's still there. I mean, every single person on the globe is created in the image of God. 
But when a person is regenerated or they are renewed and they're given this new nature, they are renewed in the knowledge according to the one that created them. It's like, it's like you now have the ability in a certain sense to actually live more in the image of God uh, because you are now God's child through redemption and regeneration. The power of new life is coursing through your veins, so to speak. And so you can see you've got the old man, this old way of living that you put off, and then you put on this new way of living or this new man, new man behavior, this new lifestyle, which is the result of uh, because you have been given this new uh, nature. So you can see that expression in Colossians 3. If we were to go back to Ephesians 4, we would, we would see the same uh, expression where it talks about this idea of new man. And uh, in, Ephes in Ephesians 4, you've got this whole section starting in verse 17, running to verse 32, that talks about, okay, how we should walk. We are not to walk as other Gentiles walk, and it describes how they walk in verses 17, 18, and 19. And then you go into verse 20, you've not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him, have been taught by him. So this is really, uh, if you've really come to Christ, you've really learned Christ. Verse 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the former lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful us. So again, here's this idea. Okay, there's a former way of living. There's this old man behavior, which uh, is corrupt according to deceitful us. And it still would be to renewed in the spirit of our mind. Verse 24, and that she put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And you can see the similarity between Colossians 3 and Ephesians chapter 4. So again, this, this idea again, okay, you got to put off this old way of living, this old man behavior, and you got to put on this, this, this new lifestyle, this, this new man behavior, and you got to put this on. And that, that is what Paul talks about when he's saying, okay, put on the armor of God. But our focus here is the idea of, okay, this is the armor of God. And in both of these passages we have looked at, what we are looking at is a miracle that's on the level of creation. And it uses this word created, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And I think it's very important that we do not view putting on the new man or putting on new man behavior as some kind of a work that we are just innately able to do. This is not something that just anybody on the street can get up and do. What we're talking about is living a lifestyle that comes out of a miracle that has taken place in a person's life, or you are given a new nature. And, and I, it's, it's hard to know, obviously, but it is possible that maybe sometimes one of the reasons you've got people who are professing Christians but they're really not living the life of a Christian. And in fact, they just don't even seem able to live the life of a Christian. Sometimes it makes you wonder if this miracle of regeneration has really taken place. Because without this miracle where you literally are given a new nature, you cannot, uh, a person in the flesh cannot please God. You've got to have this miracle. And that's why, again, it's the armor of God. This, this is sourced in God where a person by faith comes to Christ for salvation and that person is regenerated. And first John says that, that his seed, God's seed remains in that person and there is a change. It is a miracle. And we're talking to a pastor a few months ago. We talked, it was, in fact, we, we, we were meeting this couple who were in this church and newer believers. And um, the, the man in this couple, the man thought he was, thought he was saved uh, coming into the Bible studies and counseling and so on, but things were a wreck. His marriage was was a wreck, and you know, it was just you know. And in the course of the the study, he came to realize he was not saved. And when he got saved, that's when things massively changed in his life and in his marriage. And he's a completely different man today. Uh, he he does, doesn't have much in terms of money, but. Uh, during uh, the COVID crisis in their area, he he was actually like going around passing out food to other people in his neighbor area because he just thought, you know, 
I've got a God who will provide for my needs in the midst of this. And uh, so I can afford to share with other people, you know, just completely different way of looking at life than he'd ever had before. Well, what happened to this guy? A miracle. A miracle, again, almost on the level of creation, took place in this man's uh, life. And so that's when we talk about, okay, put on the armor of light and uh, now walk in the day. We're not really talking about a, a works salvation uh, or even a works sanctification. Like, okay, I, I really can do this. What we're talking about is saying, okay, God has put something in your closet, so to speak, spiritually. He has put in your closet uh, a new nature. And what we are now to do is put on that new nature and live that new nature that we have given. But obviously, to live that new nature, you've got to have that new nature. Uh, this miracle has to have taken place where regeneration, uh, you have experienced the miracle of regeneration, Titus chapter 3, verse 5, 6, and so on. Um, and that's when it's like as if God, you know, it's, I, I use the imagery in the book of putting on this, this new or, or having this new nature uh, is like somebody having clothing in their closet. But it's like at salvation, when you're truly born again, God puts this new nature in your closet. And what Paul is saying, what scripture is saying is, hey, now, you know, you've, you've got that. You've been given this new nature, a chance to live this new lifestyle. Now, put it on and start living it. And that's, that's really what we mean by putting on the armor of light or putting on the whole armor of, of God. Uh, I give this illustration uh, in, in the book of, of uh, we were shopping and at one of these thrift stores where they sell these people uh, have clothes they don't wear or whatever and they, they turn them in that this store resells them and there was this this white dress shirt that was obviously high quality in this in this you know cheap little store and my wife looks at this shirt and it's a it's a Saks Fifth Avenue shirt which is a very very high end brand and as she looks at this shirt she notices that the original price tag is still on this shirt. And the original price tag for this shirt, still on the shirt, hanging in this, in this thrift store, is 195 US dollars for a shirt, $195. The, the original, the price tag is still on this shirt. And, and the, in the thrift store, the price was $2.99, a huge difference. So we ended up buying a shirt and walking out of the store with the shirt. But evidently, here was somebody that who knows, you know, had bought or was given or, or whatever the circumstances, but they had in their closet a 195 US dollar shirt. And evidently they had never worn it. I mean, the price tag was still on it. They had had this in their closet and they had never worn it. And at some point they thought, okay, I'm never going to wear this shirt. I'm just going to get rid of it and give it to a store that can sell it again or something like that. But can you imagine having a hundred and ninety-five dollar shirt in your closet and you never wear it, especially if, especially if you paid for that shirt? <laughs> but you know, it's like God has put in our closet at salvation and in nature, and we 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 need to wear that. We need to put that on and live that out, that new nature. As Paul says, you need to walk in the day. Uh, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Our salvation is nearer than when we believe. Now, let's walk. Let's walk in light. Let's walk as a child of light and the new nature we have. And what our text goes on to, to emphasize is that in Ephesians, Ephesians 6, what it emphasizes is that we are to put on, of course, the whole armor of God. And this is the way it is stated both times in Ephesians 6, both in verse 11 and in verse 13. That we are to put on the whole armor of God. And I think what Paul is trying to get at is the importance that we don't just pick and choose in our new nature or in our new lifestyle. That we can't just say, okay, I okay, I can see the importance of, of living a different way. So, you know, I found that when I when I when I tell lies, it gets me in a lot of trouble. So I'm just gonna start telling the truth from now on. Um, but, you know, I still enjoy watching uh, the kind of movies I watched before I got saved. I still enjoy the same kind of music, and, and I'm still going to do that. 
I think what Paul is saying is, okay, if we're going to be successful in, in walking worthy of our Lord and making sure our Lord is glorified on earth, we're going to have to not pick and choose. We need to put on this whole, put on the whole new man behavior, the whole new man lifestyle. And I, if I could pull us back to, to Romans, I really feel like Romans 13, I feel like this is so key, this passage in Romans 13, the understanding this idea of putting on the whole armor of God. For one, because Paul uses in verse 12, again, this expression armor of light. And then in verse 13, he explains what he means by putting on this armor of light. It's not something magical and mystical, that it's really something practical. Um, start walking as a person who has been transformed by the God who is light. You're now a child of light. You start living like that, is what he's saying. And then if you look at verse 14, and I think really this is getting, this gets to the heart of what it means to put on the whole armor of God. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And when we talk about putting on the armor of light or putting on the whole armor of God, what we're really talking about is this. What we're talking about is putting on Christ. That the Christ that you learned in salvation, Ephesians chapter 4, the Christ that you learned in salvation, it's like it's like, okay, you are putting him on. It's, it's, it's almost like you're not just putting on the, uh, the, uh, the new man behavior that you received in him. Essentially, he, he, he is the epitome of that new man behavior. You are in him. And really what you're doing is you are putting on Christ in every area of your life. In fact, what it goes on to say is this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and what? Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its loss. No provision for the flesh to fulfill its desires. That's what we're talking about in the whole armor of God. That you're saying, okay, I am going, by God's grace, having this miracle of regeneration that, that has taken place in me, by God's grace, I'm going to live out Christ now in every area of my life, and I'm not going to make any provision to fulfill the lust of my flesh. I am all in in terms of following Christ and in living out this new nature. That's what we're talking about. We talk about putting on the whole armor of God. And very possibly one of the passages that best summarizes what we are talking about. There's another one too, and I, I'm not sure how to weave this into our discussion here. Maybe we'll get to it later, but is, is Galatians 2.20. And I think this is a verse that probably many of us uh, many of us know and probably have memorized. And there, there's a reason for that. You know, there's a reason why we, we've memorized verses like John 3.16 and uh, Galatians 2.20 and some of these other verses in the Bible is because they just, they're so meaningful. But um, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I'm going to turn there. But again, we could probably quote this uh, together um, where Paul says, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Can we think about that verse for just a minute? I am crucified with Christ. What is that? That's, that's the miracle, right? That's the miracle now viewed not so much uh, in terms of a new nature or regeneration. That's the miracle viewed in terms of our union with Christ. Miraculously, when we were saved, we were united with Christ Jesus. And that's where this verse starts. You cannot live Galatians 2.20 unless you have the miracle of union with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. And that fact of my having been crucified with Christ has ongoing consequences uh, for me in my life. And I am now a different person uh, because of that. And that's, that's what we are uh, talking about. Having been, I am crucified is a King James way of saying I have been crucified. This is something 
that has happened to me, but the consequences are ongoing. Perfect tense. If you study uh, Greek, um, I, I have been crucified with Christ. Okay, does that mean that I am dead? Well, not exactly, because I'm still alive. And so he's coming out of this idea of the, of the, of the union with Christ and his death. The fact is, okay, I do still live. But because of the miracle of this union, I live, but it's not really that I'm living. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, and that I live in this body, because I'm still in this body, I'm united with Christ, but I'm still in this body, the life that I live, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So th this is how Christ lives in us, as by faith we, in our union with him, by faith we're looking to him and in dependence on him, we are living out the life that he is living through us. We live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is like one of the things that should motivate us to really let Christ live in us is he loved us enough to give himself for me. So he gave himself for me so that I could be crucified with him so that now he could live in me and the life that I now live, I am living. He is really living through me. That really is at the essence of Christ's likeness. That's at the essence of sanctification, that it's Christ living in me. It's not just my struggling to be like Christ, although that there's a dimension to that. But it really is now Christ is being formed in me. This is Galatians again. Christ is being formed in me. And he's being formed in me. And I'm really, I'm really letting him live through me. This is the, the mystery, the miraculous mystery of our union with Christ. In Romans 6, and this is the passage. I wish I knew how to merge in with all this, but. Uh, Romans 6 tells us that if we have been united in his death or united in his crucifixion, we have been united in his resurrection. And so we died, we died with him and died in a sense to our old man. And we are not just united in his crucifixion, we are united in his resurrection. And what that means is that I can now walk in newness of life. And that's what we're talking about in terms of the whole armor of God. This idea of, okay, I've been given a new nature. At salvation, a miracle took place. I've been given a new nature. And I've been united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection, Romans chapter 6. And therefore, I can walk in newness of life. And that, that is the doctrine of, of union with Christ. And that, that would be a doctrine that would be worth meditating on. Like if you have some time where you occasionally spend time meditating, um, that would be worth meditating on is, the, is our union with Christ. And that's, what's, that's what you have in Romans chapter 6. And our union with Christ is one of the key doctrines when it comes to our living a different kind of life. And I think we all know what it is to be frustrated with our sin. And each of us has our own areas where we struggle, where, where we struggle with sin. And you say, how am I ever going to, how am I ever going to uh, overcome this, this sin? And part, a major part of the answer really, and we overlook this, is this idea of my union with, with Christ. And this does. Let me just, uh, let, me, let me take us then to Romans 6. Let me just kind of wrap this up and, and uh, if we have any questions or comments. But um, 
Romans 6 really is the key passage for this. And uh, I've uh, even had uh, one or two of my children have done uh, major memory work from this chapter. And I, 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 really, I encourage that because this, is, this chapter is at the heart of, of living, living a transformed Christian life. But looking at Romans 6 here, you can see, uh, for example, chapter 6, verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Okay, this, this is not talking about water baptism. This is talking about our, our uh, at salvation, our, our, union, our, uh, our union with Christ, our being immersed or our immersion in Christ. And that immersion in Christ um, uh, is into his death. Okay, this is our union. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, by this union with him, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, so since we've been crucified with him, that like as Christ was raised from, up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So if we were united with Christ's crucifixion, so it's like Christ and we in Christ, you in Christ, I in Christ, it's like we are one. Somebody pictured it as like somebody who's riding a horse and they get on that horse and it's like they are one with that horse. And wherever that horse goes, they go. If the horse jumps a fence, they jump a fence. If a horse races around a tree, they race around a tree. It's like they are one with that horse. So we're united with Christ and we're united with Christ in his crucifixion. Well, if we're, if we're united with Christ in his crucifixion, or I'm sorry, I should say this, if we're united with Christ and we are united with him in his crucifixion, what that means, well, he didn't stay, he did not stay crucified. He rose from the dead. So if we were crucified with him, because we're united with him, and then he rises from the dead, guess what? We rise from the dead too. And what that means is what verse four is saying, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For, here's where it kind of explains it. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, Okay, that old way of life, that that old man, that old nature, that old way of life is crucified with him. This is Galatians 2.20. That old, our old man is crucified with him. Why? That the body of sin, that this sinful body might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That that, uh, our, the, 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 the uh, uh, in our body, this, the power of, that sin, the stranglehold that sin had on us has been broken because of our union with Christ. For he that is dead is freed from sin. It's taking this, this image very, uh, you know, very, very literally. It, you, you have died with Christ. There is a deadness to sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, and this is where it starts to get practical, and there are actually four commands in here. And I'll try to uh, write, put these commands in here. So the first one is reckon yourselves... Uh, to be uh, dead to sin. That's the first one. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Really, we could add that to that uh, statement as well. But reckon, consider, think, conclude. Uh, as we think about putting on the whole armor of God, uh, living out this new nature. Uh, okay, how do I, you know, how, how do I think about the fact that I have this old nature? Uh, how do I cast off the works of darkness, Romans 13? Well, okay, reckon yourself to be dead and alive. You know, reckon that a miracle has taken place in your life. Consider that. Conclude that is true. Assume that to be true. Then number two, uh, verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Uh, and I would uh, put it this way. Uh, stop letting sin reign. Stop letting sin reign. And it's assuming that on the basis of that miracle, you can stop letting sin reign. 
you can no longer make provision for your flesh to fulfill its lust. Stop letting sin reign. Don't let it be the master. It's not in charge anymore. You actually are dead to sin because of the union with Christ. And then number, th uh, number three, verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. So stop, number three, stop yielding your body members to sin. And again, keeping in mind that every sin we commit, we sin with our body. It's very hard to do an out-of-body sin. <laughs> uh, I mean, every, every sin you commit, you commit with your body, with your mind, with your eyes, with your ears, with your hands, your feet. Okay, some aspect of your body is what you use in order to sin. And so what it's saying, okay, literally, okay, you have been, as a person, you've been united with Christ in his death and his resurrection. So you reckon yourself, okay, this body of sin is now dead to sin because it is united with Christ. So I'm going to stop letting sin reign. I do not have to let it reign. It's not on the throne anymore. It doesn't have to be on the throne. And I'm not going to yield these body members to sin. Because th these are what I use to sin. I'm going to stop this, this body. Okay, the miracle has taken place. I've got this new nature. I'm going to stop letting my body, I'm going to stop yielding my body members to sin. And then you've got number four. Um, later on in verse 13, but yield yourselves unto God. That's a number four. Yield yourselves unto God. And assuming this miracle has taken place, your union with Christ and his death, and not just his death, but his resurrection. Therefore, okay, now I can yield myself to God. I can surrender this body that before was a slave of sin. I can now, I can now take this body that was a slave to sin. I can yield it to God and say, okay, all right, I have been crucified with Christ. Unless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And I'm now going to live by faith in the Son of God and walk as he leads me to walk and live and let him live through me. And I would, I would say that, again, the Galatians 2.20, as far as passages to meditate on and thinking about this idea, putting on the whole armor of God and uh, putting on this new nature, not just, you know, you've got it in your closet, a miracle of regeneration took place in your life. Okay, but put it on, wear it, let people see it, put it on display. We talk about passages that are helpful for that understanding. I would say one of them is these verses in Romans 6 that we, we looked at. I would say another one is Galatians 2.20, which in one verse just summarizes so much doctrine as well as practical. And then I would say another, uh, another passage is Romans 13, uh, 12 through, through 14. And that's where I want to want to end is with this idea, again, of putting on the emphasis on putting on the whole armor of God. And realize, and thinking again, okay, you cannot pick and choose. We cannot pick and choose. Why? Because if you pick and choose the armor you you put on, your enemy picks and chooses where he attacks you. And a good a good enemy, <laughs> uh, a good enemy. Um, a skillful enemy, maybe I should say, a skillful enemy is going to attack you where you are vulnerable. Just like in boxing, you got boxers, they're going to attack you where you're, that, that, that's why they watch the videotape and so on. They're looking for the vulnerable spots. And you think about, and this is one of the emphasis, one of the emphases in Ephesians 6 is put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because you, um, because you have a devil who is wily or subtle, or clever. Uh, put on the whole armor of God, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers. And all of them are high in rank. Um, take in you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand and in the evil day, even. And so we've got an enemy that is clever, that is powerful, that is many, that is spiritual in nature in terms of he's not limited by flesh and blood. Uh, an enemy who's going to make sure that we have evil days in our lives. 
So we've got a very skillful enemy. And in order to defeat him, we got to put on that whole armor. We can't, we got to put on the entire new lifestyle. You got to be all in in this. And it is Romans 13. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And essentially, whatever Christ is telling you to do, you've got to do it. And in any, if there's any area where you are, are not fully his, that's where Satan's going to press the attack. Because that's where you don't have armor on. That's where you are vulnerable. And uh, in my book, I gave the illustration of Ananias and Sapphira. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure even what I think about whether or not they were truly believers or, or not. But I think it's a good example of here, here's, here's, here's a couple. They're at least in the, in the church, professing members of the church. And everybody around them is being generous. And when everybody around you is being generous, there's a whole lot of pressure on you to be generous too. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, but the problem is, is that they weren't generous. So if you're not generous, but you want to appear generous, what do you have to do? You have to lie. And it's like Satan got a hold of this aspect of their life where they really were not generous. And he got a hold of that and he used that in order to convince them to lie. Satan, if the Acts tells us, has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, that in order to appear generous, they would lie. And in the terminology of Ephesians 6, they did not put on the belt of truth. And they lied and they died. I think part of the point is what Satan did is he found a place where they were vulnerable. And that's what he does to all of us. And that's why Romans 13, 14, we've got to put on the whole, we've got to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And we've got to sometimes ask ourselves very honestly, okay, is there, are there areas in my life where I am planning to fulfill the desires of my flesh? And I think we all know what it is to have sins or pet sins or things we want. And literally in our heart, we are planning to sin. That's the opposite of putting on Christ. That's the opposite of living out the new miracle. Uh, this, this miracle of, of the new nature we have. That's the opposite of all of that. And when we plan the sin, when we make provision to fulfill the desires of our flesh, that is where you don't have armor on. And that's where you are vulnerable. And that's where you are going to be attacked. And he's going to attack you there. And once he gets in there, he's, he's, he's got you seriously vulnerable. And you are seriously weak. And you're going to fall. And you can hope that like, like Peter, when Christ says, okay, Satan, Satan has desired to sift you uh, like we, but I have prayed for you. And when you turn, you will come back. <laughs> uh, 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 I'm sorry, when, when you turn, you will strengthen your, your brethren. You can you can say okay, hopefully, Lord, that you know when I fall, I'm not going to fall away, and you're going to you're going to help me. But what you don't want to do is be vulnerable in the first place, because we are making the choice to fulfill the desires of our flesh. That essentially uh, is is what it means to put on the whole armor. So I I took a little longer there than I, I wanted to. Um, we got a really good. Uh, question here and somebody's asking are there real life examples on how to put on the armor it's very abstract I agree 100% uh, with that statement it is, it is abstract and that's why one of my burdens in, in writing this book and this and studying this passage was I wanted I wanted to get away from the idea of a mystical or a magical somehow putting on these pieces of, of armor and in terms of real life examples I guess I, I used the one just now, the Ananias and, uh, Ananias and Sapphira. But I would say that, that idea of in terms of trying to get it out of the abstract is I feel like what Paul does in Romans 13, 13 to 14, where he says, okay, put on the armor of light, because that's the end of verse 12, but put on the armor of light. And then he says, okay, now let's walk in the day. And then he gives examples. He, he, he mentions different, uh, sins there in Romans 
thirteen thirteen. And so you could you could bring up any of these as possibly you know real life examples. Uh, let's walk pro let's walk honestly or properly or decently as in the day, uh, not in rioting. Okay, that'd be like carousing, uh, wild parties. Uh, not in rioting and drunkenness. These are, these are just examples. Not in not in chambering. That would be sexual immorality, and wantonness. That would be like sensuality or lust. Not in strife uh, and envy. Not in discord or dissension or jealousy. Isn't it something that you got you got discord or strife and jealousy in the same sentence as drunkenness? Wild parties, sexual immorality, sensuality, yeah, all of this, all of them. So any of these would be examples, uh, specific examples of areas where, okay, this is this is this would be one area of what it means to okay, put on the new lifestyle. Not not living the old man behavior that's characterized or uh, referenced in these different words. Um, so I hope that helps uh, a little bit. Maybe, maybe somebody else would have some examples uh, that uh, when it comes to putting on, putting on the armor, what exactly that. But that's the idea. I would say putting, you know, putting on the armor is putting on the new man behavior, putting on the miracle of the new lifestyle or the new nature that was given at salvation. That's what it means to put on the armor of God. And in essence, it is put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision with the sword of flesh. So that's a great that's a great question because I do agree.